Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Sarah Painter. Hi Sarah. Hi Joanna. It's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Sarah writes best-selling contemporary fiction with a touch of magic and she also hosts the Worried Writer podcast and blog which helps writers with the mindset behind the writing life and she has a new book out uh, which I think you have there, don't you Sarah? I do indeed. There we go. It's called Stop Worrying, Start Writing. Yeah, there we go. And that's going to be our theme for today because, it, you know, it's so interesting that worry and anxiety and concern becomes such a big part of our creative life. So let's start by um, telling us a bit more about you. So most people think that the moment they get the magic book deal, um, everything will transform and they'll never have to worry again. But in your book, you talk about your journey to publication and how worry was actually part of that journey. So, So tell us about that. Absolutely. I was, well, I still am, to be quite honest, very, very sort of worried and anxious person. And I had absolutely no self-belief whatsoever in my writing. So um, it took me a very long time to even try to write. I wrote nonfiction. I worked as a journalist. um, And it took me years and years and years. And then when I finally did, it was such a big deal to show my work to anybody and then to submit to agents and everything just felt felt so fraught with anxiety, self-doubt, mm. procrastination, fear. And I think what I was holding on to is this idea that I would get validation. Mm. You know, that magical day when I would suddenly think, oh no, I can be a writer or I'm not too bad. And I was holding on to this idea first of getting an agent and then I would feel okay. And of course I didn't. I got an agent and I just replaced my previous worries with new ones. And then I got a publishing deal and I thought that'll be it. No, not it at all. I was still terrified and I still thought I was no good. Um, And then, so as I say, the worries just changed. I was so frightened that the night before my first book came out, I actually seriously considered phoning the publisher and saying, please don't put it out. (laughs) And was that, was that that moment? Because I think all authors feel that moment. I remember it. I felt sick that day, and I, I recorded a video, which I'm very grateful I did. Because you know, you you have to get over that moment. But was that fear of other people judging you for what you wrote at that moment, or was it not about them? It was actually more about you. Yes, the fear of judgment was massive. Um, I felt like I was going to be found out or that somebody would infer something that I hadn't intended. Um, It's that vulnerability, that fear of exposure. But I think beneath all of that was, um, or alongside that, was the fact that I hadn't I hadn't sort of worked on my internal landscape. I hadn't come up with any sort of intrinsic, you can do this or you deserve to do this. I was still always looking for that external validation Mm. and waiting for that to make everything feel okay. And um, I spoke to a writer friend of mine who'd been holding my hand for years by this point. And um, I was I was moaning to her about I was doing a postgrad at the time. I was doing a master's in writing, trying again to find this validation, this sense of belonging or um, sense of being good enough. And she said to me, Sarah, you know, at some point you just have to decide that you're good enough. You have to decide that you deserve to write these things yeah. and I remember thinking it really hit me that it had to come from me to a certain extent um so yes yeah, so the the whole shining world of publishing it just opened up a whole new load of things to worry about mm. um <laughs> and of course there are different levels as well you keep on I don't know about you but I'm always just moving the goalposts. so I went from oh I just want to get published and, you know, get that validation to, oh, well, I'm not on the front table at Waterstones. And so I'm still not a real author. Or I haven't I haven't made the one million pound book deal. <laughs> yes. and I don't have a castle in Scotland like <laughs> <Kay> <laughs> Rowling. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm not being invited to literary festivals or. Oh, so it just um, it it was a bit rubbish. I'll be honest. It, it, it was hard because I was so happy. But I felt so conflicted and um, worried. <laughs> right. So let's come back to it because you said you were a journalist. 
Yes. Uh-huh. So what is the difference between putting your words out in the world as a journalist and putting your novel out there? Oh, it's so different for me anyway, because um, with journalism, you have a style guide and you have a very specific audience. Well, perhaps actually, the more I've learned about fiction as a publishing business, uh, it's not quite as different as I first thought. But I always thought it would be because I would have the audience firmly in mind. And I would be writing generally to get across some specific information, to solve a problem, um, or perhaps to give an opinion, although that's a wee bit harder. Um, And so it felt very, very different, whereas fiction was this sort of mythical, mysterious, emotional art. And I think, as I say, as I've learned more about it, now I do think more about my audience. But what I do is I, I write the first draft is my mythical, the door is shut, my art, if you like. And then later on when it's editing, then you're thinking about the reader's experience. And that's when it gets closer to the nonfiction writing experience, perhaps a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, I mean, I find nonfiction less is less about being like the fear of judgment is less with with nonfiction. Um, although it's interesting, you know, having read your book, you do talk a lot about like your feelings and you actually have put a lot of yourself in there, as I did, I think, with my mindset book, you know, put a lot of my journals in. And and I mean, it's quite you're, you are bearing your soul there in nonfiction and you bear your soul in a different way in fiction, I guess. So were you worried? about this non-fiction book? Very, yes. Um, For exactly those reasons. Um, What I did was I'd built up to it because every time I'd written a blog post that was, that made me feel that I'd shared too much, that I'd been too honest, I'd been too vulnerable, I'd moaned too much, those got the biggest responses. And people were so overwhelmingly kind and supportive and would say, me too, and thank you for saying that. And so that kind of helped me. And also your mindset book as well. I loved reading it so much, and I was so grateful to you for sharing that it made me think, hang on now. <laughs> if I get so much from from it when other people share, it's not exactly my duty, but but perhaps it would be a good thing. Perhaps it's time I tried that you know, in the hope that it might help somebody else who feels as wobbly and insecure as I do. (laughs) But I was very frightened and I generally I don't read my reviews, but um, I did read reviews for um, for this nonfiction book um, just to check that I hadn't embarrassed myself. And I had beta readers who also that really helped just to give me that. No, you're okay. (laughs) <laughs> it's all- no I think that's really great and and I know what you mean I think it can be it can be really hard but let's before we go any further um let's just get some definitions straight because uh you know we're talking about worry and we're talking about fear and I think we all feel that but there is a scale isn't there that goes you know up to a sort of clinical anxiety level so can we just you know sort of make it clear what we're talking about so that if people are listening like they can get an idea where they might sit Absolutely. I think that's so important. Um, And I am a sort of card carrying anxiety sufferer. And when I say anxiety or anxiety disorder, I mean the medical diagnosis. It's an illness. Um, And that is very different to talking about worries, which is, you know, which I try and do. And occasionally I slip up and I'll say anxiety. But generally speaking, what we're talking about today are worries. Um, And I think, as you say, it is a sliding scale. Um, But what I would say to anybody listening is that if you have any concerns that you might, that your worries might be more than just worry, if I can put that in quote marks, um, then go and see your GP go and speak to somebody um, because if you feel that way, it's possible that it is. And there are things like um, clinical anxiety can involve things like negative thought spirals that you you don't feel that you have control over. Um, it can affect your sleep, uh, panic attacks. If any of these things are on your radar at all, then yes, please do seek professional help. And I really definitely want to say that 
a lot of the techniques that we talk that we'll talk about today and that are in the book or on the podcast or I talk about on my podcast, they can help whether you've got an anxiety disorder or or just feeling worried. But I don't want anybody to think for a second that they can just cure themselves with some, you know, a positive mental attitude and add a few habits in and you'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> I would hate anybody to feel like that for, for a second. Mm, I think that's, that is really important. And then and I think um, my thought on mental illness as well is that we all move up and down. I mean, obviously, there's some people who do sit higher on the spectrum, but we all move up and down the spectrum. Uh, like as we talk today, I've come back from a session on my book and I, I am at the point of just wanting to throw it or throw in, throw in the towel I'm just like oh this is so bad <laughs> it's that, and it's sort of the it's not it's fear and it's there's so many things bound up in it so even if like and I do believe in a, for myself a positive mental attitude is important but it keeps coming back like for, as writers and creatives the, it keeps coming back with every single project we do and it's like it's and it it's part of the process. So let's talk, let's try and um, break it down a bit. So what are some of the most common fears and worries that writers might have about their work? I think, um, I think the number one that I hear uh, from the people that I mentor or just chatting is the first off is that fear of being any good. Again, it's that idea of validation of, of there being some sort of um, external yardstick you know, which of course doesn't exist. It's a very subject. It's a completely subjective business, but I think I think that's a very common one. Um, and the other one that comes up, I think, most often is perhaps fear of failure, because I mean, for me, it was that being a writer was all I ever wanted to do since I was since I can remember, and I didn't try because if I failed at it, it would take away that dream, that possibility. You know, that would be gone. Mm. And I think that's really quite a really frightening sort of um, gut level, uh, deep fear. Um, and other fears of failure are judgment, um, you know, sort of friends or family seeing you try something and fail. I mean, it's it's a sense of embarrassment, I suppose, or maybe even shame. Um, and finally, which can often look like fear of failure, uh, is fear of success. And it sounds very, very weird, um, but but I think, again, it's fear of failure on a sort of magnified scale and fear of exposure on a magnified scale, because with every success, it's almost like you're upping the stakes or feeling more exposed to, to you know, to a greater number of people or with higher stakes. However, however almost imaginary those stakes might be. Mm. That fear of exposure, I think, is interesting because, as you said, we're having to bear our souls in many ways when we write. And by putting ourselves out there, we are exposing ourselves and then people will inevitably judge us. So the whole thing becomes this, you know, this sort of vortex. That if you, <laughs> It's almost if you think too much about it, it becomes a bit of a nightmare. And of course, this show is all about thinking about it. <laughs> but I want to come, come back to that validation because, um, you know, recently, again, as we talk, I've come back from Thriller Fest where I was up for an award and I didn't win an award and it was it was weird because I, I was thinking all the time what if I do win like that fear of success does that mean I should get an agent does that mean I should go traditional publishing like what does that mean and then when I didn't win you know uh, it's kind of like oh so I'm not a good enough writer because I didn't win the award so and it's crazy as you say because an award is external validation and the, thus is quite unhealthy but how do you tackle that need for validation or you know or that fear that you're not good enough what are the some of the ways you personally deal with that it's very much an ongoing process and I mean as you were just saying with going to Thriller Fest you know that was a sort of perfect storm for you in that it it was a time at which you couldn't get away from it it was very much front and center so what I do is that if I can avoid the trigger points if I can avoid the things when my ability to cope with that comparisonitis and my ability uh, to cope with those feelings of inadequacy, if that's really quite low, then I will avoid bookshops, for example, or I will, I will deliberately avoid the things that I know will trigger those feelings. And if I'm feeling quite good, 
Mm. and reasonably, you know, strong um, in my mind and, and with where I am and the writing's going well, I can I can go to bookshops and have just as much fun as I ever did. But I just, I'm just kind to myself now. I know, no, Sarah, you're not up for that right now. That's just going to make you feel rubbish. So you don't have to do it, you know. And so I do that. I, it's a lot of um, that sort of self-knowledge and then being kind to yourself, saying you don't have to put your hand in the fire. You don't have to read your reviews. If they hurt you too much and they stop you writing, you don't have to do it. There's no law. And that has been hugely freeing. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I don't read my reviews either, Um I do look at the overall score, uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. but I don't. Yeah. Read, I know, in fact, I've I've had my VA do it to get quotes out, and my husband do it, and but I just yeah. don't go anywhere near it because the good ones puff you up, and that and and then the For bad ones. For a few ones, seconds, yeah, though, right? And the yeah. bad ones bring you down. So this is like, oh okay, yeah, this is this is not worth it. But I do want to ask you about literary festivals because you mentioned them, and I was just emailing with an author friend today, successful author you know, as some would consider, I'm a successful enough author. Um, And both of us were saying how literary festivals make us just fall apart with comparisonitis and this validation. Because in England, you know, you and I are both in, in the UK. And it's, it's quite snobby. The literary festivals are very traditionally published and not just traditionally published, of course you're traditionally published, is, is, uh, prize winning. Literary. Yeah. yeah, Real sort of big name (laughs) and make you feel terrible. But I feel like I have to go because in that way we, you know, we have to force ourselves out there sometimes. And once you make friends with many of these authors, you realize that they feel the same way too. So talk a bit about literary festivals and if we can't avoid them or we don't want to avoid them, how can we deal with the anxiety and the worry then? Well, I think I think what you were just saying about befriending some people is perfect because it's all about the reality versus the outside, the external. You know, that, that old saying about don't compare other people's outsides to your insides. So don't look at somebody else's, you know, success or whatever it might be and compare it to how you're feeling inside because they're just not the same thing. Um, And I think with festivals, I had something recently, although I'm traditionally published, um, my... Uh, some of my books are digital only and the ones that I'll definitely print are with Lake Union which of course is an Amazon imprint so I haven't even tried but I imagine that many bookshops for example aren't going to be over keen on stocking me Um, and so that was another or you're not a real author Mm. sort of feeling but um, there's a uh, so it's not a society, what's the word I'm looking for? An organisation called the Scottish Book Trust, who are wonderful. And they have a live literature database where they, which they use to help recruit um, literature events, festivals, um, writing events at schools and libraries and so on. So I really wanted to be registered on it. But when I looked at the criteria, I realised that I didn't fit traditionally published their criteria because you had to be available in bookshops around Scotland Mm. and I didn't fit their self-publishing thing because those books are not (laughs) self-published. Old me a couple of years ago before I ran the podcast and and kind of did a lot of head work and 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 experience I would have just simply crawled away and cried. Mm. So I did the crying bit but then I thought actually they're wrong. I am an author and I have sold X number of books. I think I've probably sold a lot more than many of the people on that on that list now that I know more about the business side. So I got in touch and and said all of that and gave my sales figures and my agent, my literary agent's address and my, you know, and said I fall between these two things. And I'm sure lots of people do. Mm. There aren't that many bookshops anymore. How many authors are on a bookshop shelf for any more than a week? Yeah, that's, uh, unless they're really big names, of course. Absolutely. So they came back to me and they reviewed their policy and I'm now on the database. <laughs> and and it was a real lesson that these things, I think, as, as you were saying, yes, there's protecting yourself, which was my advice. But also, if you do feel strong enough, push yourself, mm. email them and say and question their criteria. As you said, go to the festival, but befriend some people and get the kind of the behind the scenes um, skinny on it, as it were, so that you can really make it more normal and less of a, a shining palace of 
perfection that we're not allowed into. Yeah, I think you're right. And in fact, the international thriller writers, ITW, on their, um, you know, they officially don't take indie authors. But, you know, after I met, um, they have this sort of open, if you're, you know, we, we are open to other applications but there's no standard form so I actually had to send them all of my sales figures and everything and I only had the strength to do that after I'd met some other authors and realized that my sales of indie books were far higher than many of the um, debut authors and even some of the mid-list authors so yeah I think you have to you have to weigh up your worry with and also what's the worst what's the worst that can really happen I mean they could have said to you no and you would like there you go that's life <laughs> <laughs> I think definitely that practice is again I've, I'm so wary of saying oh just do it it'll be fine it gets easier with practice because all of that is true but I also know that I'm saying that now with a few years of practice under my belt I feel oh my goodness, so much better and more able to deal with those things and to do those things. You know, Sarah of three years ago, four years ago, I would hear that advice and I would think, but I still can't. Mm -hmm. So I really want to acknowledge that while I'm saying, yes, just do it, what's the worst, which is true, it can feel like the sky will fall in and that it would just be too awful and too destroying, which is why I recommend trying to... If you feel that worried about something um, to do with your writing and you know it's something that you want to do uh, because the possible effects are going to be so good, I would suggest, which is going to sound um, a little bit, it's a little bit out there, but I suggest getting yourself um, a writer's hat and <laughs> something, I mean, really, seriously, something physical that you can put on. And so it's not you... Um, Sarah doing it it's writer Sarah doing it mm. and automate as many things as possible so if if sending an email for example um an email like that it just seems beyond you then break down break it down into a series of steps so you know you think okay well first I'm going to do my research and then I'm going to write my draft of the email and save it and then I'm going to go back in and rewrite that email and edit it and then I'm going to leave that and then the next day whenever you're sort of at your strongest mm. or lie to yourself <laughs> hit send and pretend you haven't whatever it takes but if you break it down into those those steps and then kind of just follow them as a process not letting yourself think about what you're doing if that makes any sort of sense while wearing your hat and you hit send or you send off your submission or you post something in your critique forum or whatever it is that's freaking you out mm. once you've done that you go and reward yourself reward the heck out of yourself and make it as much of a win situation just the doing it was your win and then hopefully you'll start to build just a more positive attitude to tackling those things and the tackling them to be the end in itself mm. rather than the result so just really back well away from the result yeah it's it's tough uh, and yeah I, everything you're saying is great and I'm I'm looking back and and one of the things that I love about having a blog is being able to look back and see at what point I was then. And some people who listen to this podcast um, go back and listen to the, the whole backlist, which I find crazy, but, you know, go back <laughs> to sort of 2009 when I hadn't even written a novel. Uh, you know, the first 18 months of my podcast, I didn't, I hadn't written fiction um, or I was writing fiction, but I hadn't got a book. And do you find this, you know, you said three years ago that Sarah wouldn't have been able to do it. Is it, writing blogging uh, podcasting that has actually demonstrated to you that you you can do this absolutely um and the podcasting in particular has been um hugely beneficial it's completely transformed my sort of working and creative life um because i was so fright i'm it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I, know, I think I told you this before, but it's entirely your fault um, because I loved your podcast so much and I got so much value from it and so much comfort from it. Um, it transformed the way that I thought about um, writing as a as a business. I 
then began to think of it as a business, uh, which has been very, very good in all ways. And again, it was that thing of wanting to be part of the community, not just to be consuming, Mm -hmm. to be creating something and giving something back and feeling that bit more involved. And, you know, being on being on our own so much is is great. Um, But I did also kind of miss that one-to-one connection with with people and I wanted to talk to people and I thought this is a good way to do it but I was really really frightened really frightened um but I was also a wee bit excited and I thought if I'm excited I need to do it Mm. but again the process of forcing myself to do the thing that I found so frightening by breaking it down into the steps and following through and each time lying to myself you're just going to buy a microphone you don't actually have to do anything you're just going to record a test episode nobody else has to hear it all of those steps I do a lot of lying (laughs) lying to yourself (laughs) a lot of denial denial all the way um and and so but by doing that over the last couple of years it's been so many ways but firstly that I can be scared of something and I can still do it Mm. which is huge Um, and by speaking to lovely authors and finding the same thing over and over again that I'm just not alone I'm not that weird or we're all that weird (laughs) (laughs) everybody at all these all these people that are you know I'd look up to as being so much more successful and more productive more creative um more confident and over and over again you know they would say oh yes you know self-doubt or they'd say to me you know in the chat before the we'd start recording the the interview they'd say well I could never do a podcast you know that's really terrifying yeah, it is, and it's funny. I mean, I still, um, you and I have talked before, so I wasn't worried about this one. Um, but I still get my heart still hammers. Like if I haven't met the person before online, you know, I my heart is just thumping, and you know, I I go to the toilet like three times before an interview, and and I've been doing this, you know, for seven seven years. I mean, it's it's <laughs> kind, and like when I speak, I I get the same thing, and so I I like the um you know the the kind of lying to yourself thing and and the hat do you have a podcasting uh, hat or self I do, <laughs> I do have a podcasting self my daughter says I have a podcasting voice oh. <laughs> <laughs> um I I more have a ritual where I make um I make hot water and lemon Mm. And I sort of stand up and do the sort of deep breathing and stretching my arms and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Sort of, I guess, maybe a little bit like I might have got it from your book on public speaking, actually, a wee bit of sort of psyching myself up as if I'm going to go on stage. Um, yeah, that helps. Well, that's that's great. I'm, uh, you're just you've read all my books. It's awesome. I really have. I really I can't believe I'm on this show. I listen to it every week, and I'm I'm very much um, a fan girl. So. Oh, thank you. Well, I think it's it's very interesting. I, I mean, coming back to the um, the focusing on others, like it's and that's the the speaking thing is the same the podcast is the same at the end of the day you know the reason I asked you on the show is because what you're talking about will help the listeners and that's the and you know that when you're podcasting what you're it's not about you and when you're speaking it's not about you it's always about how can I help the person on the other end the person listening or reading or or whatever so is that another way to help us frame anxiety or worry by sort of going, okay, well, how am I serving the person on the other end? Stop thinking it's about me. I think I think that's a brilliant way of framing it um, to help with anxiety. And I, I absolutely do it when it comes to blogging and podcasting and for the nonfiction book, as I say, that was... I I mean, I sort of did want to write it, but it was also that people asked me, very kindly asked me to write it. And I thought, well, you know, if a handful of people are going to, maybe one or two people will really get something from this, from my experience, then it will be worth it. And so it was very much that, as you say, focusing on the audience, focusing on the other people and what they might get. Um, I haven't done it so much with fiction, but as you were just speaking, I thought, I really, I'm missing a trick. I think I really should. I think if I could focus more on on what that um, escapism mm. 
you know, might be for the reader. That might ha- that might be another trick I can use on a bad writing day. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm reminded of uh, Christine Catherine Rush, who is you know one of my uh, heroes. She wrote a post about how important fiction is, mm-hmm. um, especially in a political time. Uh, you know, when thing p- things are difficult all over the world, and the economy is difficult, and things are difficult. And in fact, I mean, the reason I think Netflix and you know Amazon Prime Video and all these stories I've taken off is because people want to escape their lives into a story and yes delivering non-fiction is great but actually people crave a story to kind of learn about these things so yeah I think that's a really good way so just coming back to what you were also talking about the the ritual um, Mm. you do talk about habits in the book um, and how habits can be a way to work around the worry Um, so what are some habits that people can you know could try and put in place in order to get get the work done (laughs) I'm just I'm such a huge fan of habits and um when I read about this idea that you have a certain amount of decision making energy throughout the day and it just made so much sense to me and so much sense of my own experience and so rather than feeling as if oh you're just this terrible um undisciplined person who has no willpower I suddenly thought about it in those terms which I definitely encourage anybody else to do as well um and the thing about habits is that it it cuts out decisions so if I mean my favorite and best and um yeah, best habit for writing is to write first thing in the morning. Yeah. So I prepare for it the night before. The computer, you know, my netbook is by the bed, fully charged on my little lap desk. And I have I know that my husband's going to make me a cup of tea because I'm very lucky and bring me a cup of tea. And I'm going to sit up, I'm going to open that netbook and I'm going to start typing. And so everything is in place. I kind of affirm to myself that that's what I'm going to do the night before. So when I open my eyes, the moment I'm conscious... I will sit up and I pick it up and I've been doing it for so long that it really is a a sort of motor habit to lean down and and pick up that computer and and the desk and go. And it means that you kind of, if you can build it so it's automatic in that way, whatever your own particular writing habit might be, whether it's sitting at your desk at nine or after dinner, um, before the washing up perhaps, whatever it is, if you can make it a habit so that it's completely automatic, you don't have to choose to write. At that point, you have to choose not to write. Mm. So it's sort of using that lack of decision energy for you, if you see what I mean. And when it's automatic, it's it sort of, there's less space for your worries to come in. And the reason I like first thing in the morning so much is that because I'm not fully awake, I've, I've not, I've got less resistance because I'm not fully awake yet. So, mm. you know, all my resistance sort of um, brain is not firing on all cylinders yet. Um, and I'm sort of closer to the sort of subconscious um, sleepy space, I suppose. Mm. Um, so that really helps. And also the day has not begun. You know, you've not had time to be distracted by anything else. So I definitely recommend that or, you know, certainly giving it a try. Um, but yes, in terms of habits, it's cutting out those decisions making it so that it's just something that you're going to do and it's also focusing on the process of it again so it's always you know whatever the habit is set a really really small one to start with Mm. so you know it could be five minutes of of writing or 10 minutes of thinking about your novel and then hook it onto something that you already do you know so this is why I said maybe after dinner let's say you always get up after dinner and do the washing up before you go through to watch Netflix as an example. So instead, you could say, well, okay, I'm going to add in my 10 minutes of writing time in between those two things. So and then if you stick to that for a couple of weeks, it will just be part of that little routine. Mm. And I do think it's easier to do if you hook it onto something that you already do every day. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. And on that TV thing, it's so interesting because we've actually, like, again, today, a, a TV has arrived. Now, we haven't had a TV for six years because 
we get, you know, part of writing uh, when I wanted to become a writer, in fact, longer than that, it must have been, yeah, when I decided to be a writer, like back in 2009, we got rid of the TV because it was distracting. And so I made the decision not, you know, not to watch TV. But TV was pretty crap back then. And now it's amazing. <laughs> now so it's it, brilliant. Yeah, now it's brilliant. And there's so many stories that are so engrossing. So, but mm-hmm. what you've just said there is really good point because in the past I would have said to people, why aren't you writing in the evening? Why are you watching TV? And now I'm watching TV in the evening myself. And so I'm like, but what you've said about finishing your dinner and maybe doing the washing up and then putting some writing time in before you go mm-hmm. and sit down. Because the problem is once you sit down, it's very hard to pull yourself away unless you're a night owl. And I'm a morning person. So uh, for me, it's always a morning like you. Um, but the, the other thing I find is that I can't... I can't write fiction at this desk. So where I'm standing now, the, my sitting standing desk, I podcast, I email, I do my blog. Um, do you find this as well? Do you find that you have to do your fiction in a different place to your non-fiction? It's something that I've been trying to sort out, to be quite honest, over the last few months, because I always used to write fiction at this. Um, this is my iMac in my lovely garden office, bought for the purpose of writing in. Wow. Awesome. Um, I know, brilliant. And it got, the whole point there was to get me out of bed, because I used to write in bed. Mm. And I still do first thing in the morning, as I admitted. Um, but I used to write all the time in bed, and it was very, very bad for my back. Yes. Um, but now I do so many more things, and now I run the I run the business and I do the worried writer and there is just more business stuff to do and I do it all at this iMac in my garden office and I found that it's harder to write fiction in here now and mm. um, because it's so it's got too many other associations so uh, I think I, I think it might have been Dean Wesley Smith that talked about getting a dedicated writing computer mm. so um, I bought a a Neo for 30 quid or something on eBay, which is a really old word processor Mm. with a tiny little screen which shows you, you know, five lines of text or something. And it runs on AA batteries. (laughs) (laughs) It's amazing. The battery's gone forever. It's super light, really rugged. It's it's basically it was built for education purposes Mm. to be cheap and cheerful for schools. Um, So I will write on that. If I'm being, if I really need to focus and I'm being feeble about it, um, or I'll go somewhere else. I know that you go to cafes to write, so mm. I'll sometimes do something like that. Um, although not very often because I feel bad about not using my office. Because <laughs> you've got it specially. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, and I, uh, so what I'm now, because I'm trying to dictate as well, and as we were talking. I really um, want to try that. <laughs> well, this is the other thing. We were just talking about sharing our offices with our respective husbands before the show. And of course, now I can't dictate in my office because my husband husband's here and you know with fiction and also with the dictation I'm still not finding you know you you can't have a brilliant sentence I mean you sound like an idiot so <laughs> I've now I'm now writing and you can't dictate in a cafe or at least I don't know I mean it, that would be mad you probably shouldn't <laughs> no exactly not with my type of book so um so I'm ending up I'm going I'm dictating in the afternoon at a I, I get a co-working space for two hours a, a room in a co-working space and I dictate for as long as I can, you know, within the two hour period. And then in the morning session, I'm just right now, because I'm in first draft, um, kind of going through and just editing a, a bit and and making sure the, the recording works. So, so it's so interesting how this sort of process hacking works, but it's interesting how you're finding the, the issue with the space as well. So if people listening are finding that, like if they are managing multiple brands, fiction, nonfiction and struggling, that's definitely a way, isn't it, to split it? Because otherwise, you end up worrying about not writing your fiction (laughs) (laughs) something that I have um that I have tried as well which is working quite well I just I just remembered um with the iMac is that I when I realized I didn't have another space to set up a, a really good um a good working space you know a good desk and all of that for the RSI and bad back and so on um so what I did was I set up a different login profile for my iMac so there's writer Sarah So if I log in as writer, Sarah, there is nothing else on my desktop. I've taken everything else, you know, out of the, I'm looking at it now, sorry, out of the taskbar along the bottom. So I've removed everything except Scrivener. Oh, that is a good tip. So when I go in there, well, and also iTunes because music, but but when I go in, I know it's, it's like a signal to my brain. 
it's writer Sarah. There's nothing else there. There's I don't get distracted by audacity in the corner and think, oh yes, I need to, you know, yeah, edit that can't. podcast interview or whatever. There's none of that. And I've got a nice um inspirational picture on the you know, on the on the background and everything, and that's really helped. That's um, really good because I mean, I have a laptop. This is a, a, a laptop, and I take the same laptop to the cafe, and I write on the same laptop. Uh, okay. Elsewhere. Uh-huh. So, so, but that login is super. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to do that because that. I mean, that there are obviously pros and cons of running a non-fiction writing business at the same time as being a fiction writer, um, and and this is kind of yeah, what one of them is is splitting yourselves into two, um, but just. You know, you mentioned before that the podcast has helped and the blog has helped. Um, have you found, like, just on the business side, because uh, someone, a fiction writer, came to me the other day and just said, you know, the money is difficult as a fiction writer. Have you found that having that multiple streams of income, so sales of nonfiction, other things, does that help you as a as a writer, as a businesswoman writer? Absolutely, it helps not just in the kind of bottom line of, as you say, getting multiple streams of income is good because seeing more income is good. But I think it's also good uh, from a sort of psychological point of view, because I find writing nonfiction uses quite a different energy. Mm. Um, It sort of feels as if there are other possibilities. You know, if I'm feeling particularly low about about my creative writing, um, it'd be very easy for me to spiral into a you're never going to write another book that anyone will ever want to read and you're going to have to get a proper job and everything is awful. And so it really helps me to be able to think, ah, but you could write a blog post about these feelings. Mm. That's quite practical. But also you have this other strand of writing that you do that isn't quite as dependent um, on the muse is the wrong expression because I do believe in just the hard work and the craft. But... Does that make sense? It, it, it's not so inspiration mm. uh, contingent. It's it's contingent on identifying other people's needs yeah. and answering them. It's a skill. It, it feels more like a skill that I have nonfiction writing. I've you know I've written articles on you know computer graphic design and all kinds of things. You learn about it. You write about it. That that was my training, and so it just feels more of a workaday kind of a skill that I can use and for. Fall back on is the wrong word, but it does help me feel a wee bit more uh, secure. Yeah, no, that's however great. wrong that might be. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think it is, and I also think that fiction book sales are. Uh, interesting in that they go up and down in cycles so for example in Britain right now there's just been this thing come out that says psychological thriller with a female protagonist that is um, what's the word uh, you know lies or whatever um, yes. uh-huh. is, is unreliable narrator unreliable yeah. narrator is a woman you know with a uh-huh. girl in the title is now yeah. over like that is yeah. over that's it we're not buying that anymore yeah, that's we're not buying done that. yeah. <laughs> so it's like okay but what if you, those are the types of books that you write what um, if you just spent four years writing that <laughs> and, and so I'm like, look, if you, you know, but what's also brilliant is, is they're reporting that self-help books are coming round and positive Good. self-help <laughs> books. Exactly. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so, so, but back, back on fiction, I think this, the cyclical nature of the book environment means that if you have different books that address different things, fiction and nonfiction, um, you know, like I have um, action adventure that's a bit like Dan Brown. Now, Dan Brown, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for it to come round again, but he has a new book out. He's such a slow writer mm-hmm. but he has a new book out this this uh, fall uh, this autumn so I'm like yay hopefully that will help me but I think it's so important to balance your different writing side and as you say I think you can almost separate your ego more from non-fiction than fiction so it makes you feel better but but bef- um we, we're out of time we could talk forever but um <laughs> d- tell us um tell everybody about your fiction because we've talked a lot about the wor- <laughs> you know the worried writer stuff but tell us about your what is your fiction <laughs> what is my fiction well um the first the first three books um are sort of contemporary fiction with a sort of touch of magic so it's in this world but there is a bit of magic going on a um, bit of supernatural um i can't get away from supernatural it, it always pops into my books Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and they're kind of, well, hopefully quite fun and sort of emotional women's fiction, I suppose. And then last year, In the Light of What We See came out, and that is part psychological thriller and part historical, mm. sort of a dual narrative. And that was my first book with Lake Union. And uh, Lake Union have um, given me a deal, hurrah, uh, for another book, which will be coming out early next year. And that's called Beneath the Water. And that's also got a wee bit of historical 
Mm. along with a present day strand yeah and just tell people where you are in the world as well because people have oh, i'm in this... scotland <laughs> yeah because you have, a, you have a little bit of an accent but it's not too not broad is it? Uh-uh. no no not at all well i'm actually a bit weird because i was born and brought up in wales um by a scottish mother and an english father so what we can basically say is that i'm british <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um, so so yes yeah, so i've just been living in scotland for the last 12 years or so so Mm, no that's brilliant okay so tell people where they can find you and your books and your podcast and everything online <laughs> wonderful well for my fiction if you go to sarah-painter.com um, then you can find about my books there and The Worried Writer is of course available on all good uh, podcast catchers um, or you can go to worriedwriter.com and you will always find me not always, I shouldn't say that. You might often find me procrastinating on Twitter at Sarah R. Painter. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Sarah. That was great. Oh, thank you, Joanna. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>